Hello and welcome to a new week with the electric trucker. This time I'm transporting a battery integrated charging station from the UK to Germany with the smallest electric truck in our fleet, the Volvo FE Electric. And in between I'm participating in the 24 hour e-race on the Hockenheim ring. This week was a real challenge and things did not went smoothly for many unexpected reasons. Before I'm off to the UK, I have a short trip carrying CO2 bottles for the central fire suppression system of a ship. Sprinkler systems on ships also need regular maintenance, and this time the bottles need to be replaced. And here at the port there are Kempower charging stations, definitely meant for trucks, but not accessible for me. These straddle carriers are so impressive. They look like those AT-ATs from Star Wars. They drive right over the container and pick it up, and they're tall enough to stack the containers too. I could watch them all day. A new day begins, and I'm now heading to England with the Volvo FE Electric. It's the middle of February, and winter has fully kicked in, so this is going to be quite an adventure. I'm taking this truck to England because the cargo requires a crane. Normally you'd use the diesel version, but then you'd be watching diesel trucker, not electric trucker. Still, this is a lot of fun and definitely a cool challenge. This truck is not made for long distance travel, but sometimes you just have to test what's possible. It has a total capacity of 210 kilowatt hours. In these cold conditions, that gives it a range of slightly over 200 kilometers. It's currently charging at 130 kilowatts and can be fully charged in about 1.5 hours. It's more maneuverable than a truck with a trailer, but still a tight fit at charging stations. At the back, it has a crane powered by a hydraulic pump connected to the PTO. Volvos can do 43 kilowatt AC charging, so in theory, you could fully charge it at a 22 kilowatt wall box in 10 hours. I'm heading to Hook van Holland now to catch the ferry to Harwich. You can tell the interior is all about function. These trucks need to be affordable, so you don't get a lot of design cycles or fancy upgrades. You've got all these physical buttons and an old school DIN radio. Even the adaptive cruise control and the regenerative braking have to be activated manually on these buttons. It does have a lane departure warning system, so even though the design is dated, it has everything you actually need. Here's the remote for the crane. You can strap it on, so you don't have to stand right next to the crane while operating it. It has a built-in battery and a second one that charges while you're driving. So the concept is really solid. There's also a blind spot camera that activates automatically when you turn past a certain angle. I'm at a small Fastnet station in the Netherlands. There are only four spots here and Fastnet has a weight limit, so you're not allowed to drive in with a large truck. The charging curve isn't really a curve, it's more like a straight line. 130 kilowatts isn't ultra fast, but this is a local construction truck. And for that, it's totally reasonable. Energy consumption is great too under one kilowatt hour per kilometer, even with the crane standing out. And I'll say it again, this isn't a typical use case for this truck, but a lot of construction companies and businesses are interested in smaller trucks. And it's helpful to know how one of these performs on longer trips. You might need to transfer it somewhere or have the occasional long distance job that requires mid route charging. In that case, things just take a bit longer because charging power is the limiting factor, but I really enjoy driving it. I'm checked in and I'm absolutely starving. I've got my own room with dinner and breakfast included. The ferry ride itself is only eight hours, but I boarded two hours early, so I've got 10 hours total. I'm grabbing something to eat now and then head straight to bed. At the buffet, there was every kind of meat imaginable, but nothing vegetarian. So I asked and 10 minutes later, they brought me a vegan burger. Everyone around me was jealous. A bunch of people started asking if they could get a burger too. Definitely a highlight on the ship. The chefs cook the same meals every day so when someone has a special request, they actually enjoy making something different. And I could taste it right away. It is a Beyond Meat burger. And the cheese tasted really weird too, so I'm pretty sure it's vegan. Here's a little look into my two-person cabin, and here's the bathroom with a shower. Breakfast starts tomorrow at quarter past five. Good night. My first charging stop in the UK is at a Shell station. There's plenty of space here, but the prices are insanely high. Everything is monitored by cameras, and the parking operator is also involved in managing the charging process. Say what you want about idle fees, but this goes way further. You get fined 100 pounds if you stay longer than one hour, even if you're actively charging. And you're not allowed to start a new charging session within two hours. I don't know if this was arranged with Shell Recharge or if it's something the site partner insisted on. Every rule has its story, but this still feels a bit extreme to me. My appointment was scheduled for tomorrow morning, but now it turns out the customer has canceled the job. They had concerns that something might get damaged by the crane, even though they were already informed and had approved the job. We made a bunch of calls and now the new plan is to load the goods using a heavy duty forklift. 
One of those will be available next week, so the schedule has been delayed. My ferry ticket was already booked for the way back, but I'll need the truck next week here again, so I'll leave the truck at the port, take the ferry and train back to Germany, and then come back next week. I'm back at the port in Harwich and I was getting nervous because there are no parking spots anywhere. I asked around and luckily managed to get a parking space. It costs £100 for six days, which is super cheap considering a single night at a rest stop already costs £50. After this ultra long day, I'm now on my way to the ship. My driving hours almost ran out too, but I just made it in time. I'm back at my home base and the train ride back went uneventful. And while I was away, we got some new cars, three brand new ID7s really beautiful cars, and they were actually the best-selling electric cars in January. Good morning from the Hockenheim Ring. Today the 24-hour race starts. The goal is to complete as many laps as possible within 24 hours, and 31 teams are taking part. This is our pit box, and this is our Hyundai Ioniq Classic. I still need to clear out a few things to save weight. That little one definitely has to go. As you know, an electric car can't drive non-stop for 24 hours, so of course we have to recharge in between. Each pit box has a 20 kilowatt DC charger shared between two teams, which means communication and coordination are key. That's actually the biggest challenge of the race. There are three equally important factors with electric cars, battery size, energy consumption, and charging power. Since the charging power is the same for everyone, it's a battle between battery size and efficiency. And battery size isn't the Ionix strength, but efficiency is. So the longer the race goes on, the more the Ionix advantage grows. Before the race starts, we're doing a short lap behind the safety car with the whole team. Surprisingly, five huge people actually fit inside the Ionic. And yeah, it's almost pay to win here because there's even a Lucid Air competing with the biggest battery of them all. Luckily, I still have all the data from the last race. We tracked everything, state of charge, lap times, energy consumption. So now we can optimize and find the best balance between efficiency and lap time. Now the night phase begins. This is usually the toughest part. Jens is in live radio contact with Norbert, so we're constantly exchanging lap times and energy consumption. We're doing pretty well so far, but it's going to get exciting toward the end, because the big question is whether we'll be able to catch up to the cars with the larger batteries. I'll keep it short and simple. We broke down with the Ionic. We had been steadily climbing to fourth and fifth place, and it was looking really good because the other cars were consuming so much energy. Our consumption was between 12 and 13 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, while other cars were using 24 or 25 kilowatt hours. But then the car showed a warning message, shut down and couldn't be switched to drive mode. After disconnecting the 12 volt battery, the car worked again. And even after losing 50 minutes because of it, we were still doing well in the race and wanted to keep going. But after 15 more laps, the same error message appeared and we broke down again. At that point, I had to make a decision, so we gave up. The error message was check electrical system, which could mean anything with the Hyundai. It's being repaired now, but I'm not sure what exactly went wrong. And it was also a logistical nightmare for me as a digital nomad who lives in and around my car. I dropped the dog off at my parents' place and then took the train back to England. There's another race at Hockenheim in the fall, but it's only 18 hours. The Ionic doesn't have a chance there because it shows its strengths in efficiency over time. But next year, we will try again. It's Tuesday and I'm back in Harwich where I left my truck. It survived the weekend without any issues. I have to go through customs, but I shouldn't have any problems since I never left the country. I left it with 30% charge, but now when I start it, it's down to 10%. And there are no fast chargers here in Harwich. That's definitely throwing off the day. I've driven a few kilometers and found a charging station by Pogo Charge, but I'm being charged by a generator. I've never seen this before. The grid connection hasn't been set up yet, so they've temporarily installed these generators. It's more efficient than burning fuel directly in the truck, but that's not a consolation. I'm only charging enough to get to the next fast charger. I'm now in Watford at Shell Recharge and parked perfectly in the delivery zone. This is a perfect example of a hybrid charging park. I don't think they initially planned for the delivery zone to be used for truck charging, but since it's not used for deliveries all day, it's beneficial for everyone if trucks can charge here. I'm loaded now and the question is whether I'll make it to the ferry in time 
as I only have an hour for customs and it's a hazardous goods transport. I'm making my last charging stop now and here you can see what I'm transporting, a charging station with its own battery. This one wasn't manufactured but tested here and now it needs to be transported to Germany. And of course, it's perfect to transport something like this with an electric truck. Regular fast charging stations require a strong grid connection and these battery supported charging stations are perfect for areas where there isn't a strong grid connection. It has a 195 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate battery installed, which is charged via the slow grid connection. When a car or truck arrives, it can be charged at a high charging rate. And since the utilization throughout the day isn't constant, it makes total sense to buffer that with a battery storage system. We're seeing this more and more because grid connections are expensive and take a long time to install. A charging station like this can be set up and connected quickly. And because battery prices continue to fall, these charging stations are becoming viable alternatives to building new grid connections everywhere. I'm at the harbor, and they were already waiting for me because hazardous goods trucks park in designated areas. The ship departs in half an hour, and I have 20% battery left. All the hazardous goods trucks are parked together. And I have to say, no other truck could have done it faster. I arrived in England this morning and now I'm back in the evening. And since there are only two ferries a day here, a larger truck with a bigger range or even a diesel wouldn't have made it any faster. This morning, I drove off the ferry and was directed out. Over time, step by step, the trucks around me were picked up. After several hours, everything was empty, so I went to the customs office at the front. I knocked and the staff kept pointing at the closed sign so I couldn't ask anyone. Then I started calling people and it turned out that the T1 document needs to be uploaded digitally. Of course, no one told me that. I forwarded it to the dispatch team and they passed it on to our customs agent. Another two hours passed to find out that the document can't be uploaded because it's a UK document and you can only upload Dutch documents. They suggested I just ask customs, but they aren't open yet. I've already been stuck here for almost eight hours. It's honestly unbelievable. Such a waste of time. I don't even think it's bureaucracy. It's more about the flow of information. When no one knows what to do, no one informs you, and your contacts don't even know what's going on, it becomes a huge problem. What I could imagine is a check-in via an app. You enter your license plate and ferry reference number, and then there's a checklist. It would show the type of transport, what to consider, and then there would be a green check mark or a red cross. It would also provide detailed instructions on what to do. This could be done in multiple languages and wouldn't require any phone calls. It's a simple solution and you could represent even complex processes in it. But today really symbolizes logistics. You work hard to make sure you meet deadlines and then you waste your entire day on something like this and there's nothing you can do about it. After more than nine hours, I was finally allowed to leave the port. I went straight to this fastnet charging station with 5% battery left. Unfortunately, there are no charging stations in the harbor. Otherwise, I could have easily topped up the battery there. Driving at night is definitely the most fun because all the charging stations are empty, but I arrived with 11%, turned the truck off and on, and then there were only 4% left. Just like my Evoco, this Volvo also struggles with calculating the remaining range. I got a call today from the dealership that towed my Ionic. They checked the car and found no issues. Even after driving on rough terrain, which is similar to the racetrack, there were no errors. The stored error was from the rotor position sensor of the electric motor, but that hasn't happened again. They thoroughly checked the car, cleaned the contacts, and that's all they can do for now. And we finished the trip. I still have 11% left, and it's 3 in the night. I'll charge it now and head to customs around noon. The trip was pleasant, but the problem is that when you start the day with a nearly empty battery, so much time gets lost because of charging. I am now at the customs office in Emden with the Volvo because I have to declare the goods with the same vehicle that I transported them with. I'll drive back in a moment, then I'll load everything onto my Evoco and head to Braunschweig. I'm really glad to be driving a big truck again because it's much more comfortable. But it was a great tour and the Volvo performed incredibly well. For short distances or deliveries to construction sites, it's a great vehicle. Let me show you how the crane works. First, you need to activate the PTO. Then, the air suspension at the front and back lowers all the way down. After that, I have the remote control with which I can turn on the PTO. Next, I need to extend the stabilizers and the floor plates are used for weight distribution. 
Now we need to switch from hydraulic drive to the crane mode. With the first lever, you raise the crane at the first pivot point. With the second lever, you can extend the other pivot point. The third is for extending and the fourth for rotating. I delivered the charging station near Braunschweig, washed the truck, and now my Evico will stay here over the weekend, because I have to pick up goods nearby next week. So now I'm taking the train to pick up my car, and then I'll get my dog with the car. I found my car and I got the tip to replace the 12 volt battery as a precaution. But that's it for this video, and we'll see each other next week. Ciao.